this is an immunology video that is actually a chemistry video. We are going to leave the immune response and go into straight inorganic chemistry about halfway through this video. Um, because this is the process by which phagocytes, which are basically the cells that go in and gobble everything up, break down what they need. So this is kind of like the metabolic pathway of your immune cells. So first off, let's just start really, really simple. For those of you who maybe don't have much background in this, what is phagocytosis? Phagocytosis is basically the process by which cells of the innate immune system engulf large particles. And by large, I mean pretty large, um, 0.5 micrometers or greater. Um, so that's pretty big when you think about the size of a cell. Um, so all animal cells in general are able to ingest molecules, soluble, soluble molecules. And that's good. That's part of how we get, you know, nutrients and vitamins and all sorts of things that um, Dr. Zabo will teach you about. Um, but this is not phagocytosis. That is endocytosis or pinocytosis. Phagocytosis is for, for the big stuff, okay? Um, so it's engulfment, all right? It's a larger thing. There are really only four professional phagocytes in the body. And the reason they're referred to as professional is that they have the enzymatic machinery to destroy or to kill what they've eaten. Um, so the, the only um, phagocytes that you really need to worry about are monocytes and macrophages ages, which monocytes are, remember, the um, blood form of the macrophage, and macrophage is the tissue resident form of the monocyte. Um, neutrophils are the other big one, and we're going to talk about them a whole lot, um, and eosinophils. Now, there are other cells that we will talk about in a later date that are capable, while they are immature, of phagocytosing and breaking down an antigen. And those are known as dendritic cells, but they are only able to do this while they are immature. As they mature, they do an entirely different function known as antigen presentation, and we'll talk about that later. So really your professional phagocytic cells are your monocytes, macrophages, neutrophils, and eosinophils. So we're gonna talk about the steps that basically lead to the elimination of microbes by professional phagocytic cells. Um, when we're trying to get rid of a cell, the, of, a, of a pathogen that's being engulfed, the first step is to just try to contain it. And that's done in the phagosome. The phagosome basically surrounds the engulfed pathogen and is what leads to its ultimate destruction and removal from the body. In some cases, the organism can be destroyed in the phagosome and the cell will continue to live and go on to kill again another day. In other cases, um, for some microorganisms that are engulfed, the phagocyte kind of has to go down with the ship. It makes the ultimate sacrifice and dies in the process of destroying the pathogen. Um, but first, let's lay some general um, characteristics of phagocytes. Um, so first off, phagocytes are not replicative. So they are in their final differentiated form and they're never going to change. They're not going to make more of themselves. These aren't like lymphocytes that when they are activated, they grow. When these guys are activated, they kill and that's about it. Um, it's a kill or be killed. And in this case, sometimes kill and be killed kind of world. So they're non-replicative. They are part of the innate immune response and they're capable of phagocytosis and elimination of ingested mi mac microbes. That's pretty much the whole story. The two most important important phagocytes of the immune system are the neutrophils and the macrophages. Um, you can kind of tell them a little bit apart by the fact that neutrophils are polymorphonuclear cells. So you can see this kind of strangely low bar shaped um, nucleus. Um, and the macrophages are, uh, they're tissue resident monocytes. So they kind of have a, just a more distinctive shape. So you can see some of the kind of main differences here. So like I've said before, they're tissue resident. They are derived from the monocytes, but they are slightly different. Macrophages tend to target extracellular material or acting kind of like the garbage trucks of the immune system 
intracellular bacteria when they ingest um, dead and dying cells, okay? So particularly, they're gonna go ahead and ingest neutrophils that have recently died, and that's another way for them to acquire um, pathogens, which they eat. Macrophages, unlike neutrophils, are actually capable of antigen presentation um, to CD4 positive T cells. Um, so that's something that down the line, once we have effector cells that are being recruited to the tissue area, they can actually present antigen and say, you know, come over here, help with this problem. Um, they often are able to survive the process of phagocyte mediated killing better than neutrophils because they're not as aggressive as at killing as neutrophils. Neutrophils, on the other hand, are a little bit different. Um, they are the first cell that's kind of called to the site. So the macrophage is already there. Um, and then neutrophils are actually called to the site from something called the granulocytic reserve. Um, so the granulocytic reserve is basically in your bone marrow, and it's where the majority of your neutrophils hang out until there's some sort of inflammatory event, in which case they're released into the blood in massive quantities and then follow a series of chemokine signals that leads them to the site of inflammation. They tend to target extracellular bacterial infections. They have a very short survival period, about four to five days in the blood and one to two days in the tissue. Neutrophils are highly inflammatory and highly deadly, so we don't really want them hanging around for a long period of time because that obviously could lead to destruction. Because they're so aggressive at killing and so inflammatory, they tend to die during the process of phagocytosis-mediated killing of bacteria. And we'll talk about the, the pathway that leads to their death. So there are a lot of steps involved in actually killing a pathogen. The first step is one you probably could have guessed from our earlier conversations about pathogen recognition. And that's the first step, just recognition. Is this something I should eat? And if I eat it, can I destroy it and how? Um, this is similar to looking at a menu of food when you're sitting in a restaurant. What is the thing I'm going to eat and how do I grab it? So um, a bacterium can be phagocytosed by a neutrophil or a macrophage based on the PRRs and PAMPs that it, the, the bacterium expresses. So the bacterium will express the PAMPs, the uh, macrophage will, or the neutrophil will express the PRR. And in many cases, this is something like CD14 binding to LPS or some combination of antibody or complement receptor that allows the phagocyte to opsonize it easier. Um, opsonization isn't a concept we've talked about much yet, but it is a very important concept in immunology. So opsonization is easy eating. It's the equivalent of eating um, with a fork and knife as opposed to with your hands. It's going to be a lot cleaner and easier to put that food in your mouth if you're using the right tools. And the same is true for our phagocytes. All right, so once the phagocyte has identified that it wants to eat something, it's going to take it in, and then there's going to be the formation of the phagosome, which is basically what took in the bacterium. And then you have two sets of granules that are going to come together to try to attack the pathogen. And those are the azerophilic and the specific granules. And we'll talk more about those in a moment. The, the work of these granules is going to change the pH in the phagosome into a, basically um, a more lytic uh, environment. This will also fuse with a lysosome, creating a phagolysosome. Once that has occurred, we can actually have generation of reactive oxygen species, um, which could lead to the death of the actual cell. In other cases, though, you might actually just have death of the pathogen here. Um, but if the reactive oxygen species uh, pathway is chosen, the neutrophil will die and later be picked up by a macrophage, because remember, they're going to eat those dead and dying cells. All right, so now is when we start getting into just straight up chemistry at this point. So remember, there are two types of granules that are already ready to go in your phagosome. There's your azerophilic, sometimes referred to as your primary granules, and your specific and tertiary granules, okay? Um, the azerophilic granules are called this because they have a beautiful blue color, um, so they're easily identified. The specific granules are going to degranulate 
first. The specific granules contain proteases hydro and hydrolases, which are active at a neutral pH. And this is important because initially that's the pH within the phagosome. It's neutral. They fuse with the phagosome, dumping their enzymes in. As the organism dies, potassium and hydrogen ions are drawn into the phagolysosome and decrease the pH down to about a 4.5, which is fairly acidic. And that's exactly what the azerophilic granules need to become activated and kind of join in this killing process. So at this point, the azerophilic granules are going to merge with the vacuole. The azerophilic granules contain hydrolases like cathepsin G and oxidative enzymes like myeloperoxidase, which is shown here. Um, these work best as, at an acidic pH. These granules cause significant damage, hopefully leading to the destruction of the bacteria. However, this process alone, and this is just kind of the, the warm-up lap for the phagocyte, is going to result in the killing of only about 2% of the pathogen that the phagocyte engulfs. The majority or the remaining 98% of the pathogens that the phagocyte ingests are going to be killed in the next step with the creation of the reactive oxygen species. All right, so I've called this slide creation of a bleach fireball because that is how my predecessor, uh, Dr. Lint, used to talk about this. It's basically the cell creating a you know vat of bleach dumping gasoline on it and then lighting it on fire and that's pretty akin to what's happening in the cell at this point in time so this process is sometimes known as respiratory burst other times you might hear people refer to it as oxidative burst all of these processes lead not only to the death of the pathogen but also of the neutrophil um, nothing organic can survive this assault. And the neutrophil is most definitely organic. Um, the neutrophils really excel at it. Macrophages are capable of it, but the neutrophils are really your main offenders in this case, or attackers. Um, okay, so what is this? At its heart, oxidative burst results in the production of nitric oxide and reactive oxygen species. Reactive oxygen species are basically chemically unstable molecules that contain oxygen, okay? Um, and these would be things like superoxide anion and hydrogen peroxide. Um, back when I was in junior high, we had to take home ec. And one of the things that they taught us was that hydrogen peroxide would take blood out of clothes. And the way they show this is basically if you have, you know, a little bit of blood on a cotton, you know, swab or whatever, and you dump H2O2 on it, it will suddenly start bubbling like mad and be lifted out. It just kind of creates this mini chemical reaction that lifts it out of the clothing and then you can rinse it away and your white t-shirt is saved from, you know, whatever happened that led to you having blood on it. And the same is basically true in our neutrophil. Um, these molecules, superoxide anion and hydrogen peroxide, can bind to molecules within the cell that basically lead to tissue damage. So what's the process that leads to this? We're going we're gonna to do some chemical reactions here. Much as I um, do not enjoy chemistry, this process really is kind of amazing that we're able to control it even in the first place because it's so, so potent. All right, so oxidative burst begins when the phag phagolysosome forms, and that activates a very specific enzyme, and that enzyme is NADPH oxidase. NADPH oxidase is basically going to transfer an electron to two oxygen molecules. And when it does that, it's going to form two superoxide anions and a lone extra hydrogen ion. Okay, so we're going to have these two now super unstable um, oxygen and hydrogen based molecules available. Now, we're going to have another enzyme come into play now, and this enzyme is superoxide dismutase. Superoxide dismutate is, dismutase is going to convert this hydrogen ion and superoxide anions 
into hydrogen peroxide. And remember, just like my example with the blood on the clothes, this is bad for anything organic because it's going to destroy it, okay? This is highly toxic to microorganisms. Now, while all of this is happening, you've got NADPH over here and oxygen. When you have NADPH and oxygen, an arginine is basically converted into nitric oxide. This process, this transfer into nitric oxide, is controlled by another enzyme still, known as inducible nitric oxide synthase, or INOS. INOS is really great at creating nitric oxide. Nitric oxide is super toxic to cells as well. So nitric oxide, hydrogen peroxide, and um, oxygen anions, basically, or um, superoxide anion, are all working together to destroy the pathogen. And basically what happens is here's your pathogen all the way down here, and up here you have NADPH oxidase. And it basically goes, hi, little pathogen, let me go through a stepwise fire to destroy the pathogen and break it up by lighting it on fire. And it's actually funny, my predecessor, Tom Lint, who was a grad student when some of this was being um, discovered, was in the lab one night and him and his colleague were looking at this process under a um, fluorescent microscope and without any tagging, they could actually see the cells lighting up as they destroyed these pathogens and then died. Um, so this is actually kind of a fireball because it is luminescent under its own activity. And this process is what actually leads to destruction of pathogens. This is a very important pathogen. Um, the action of the phagosome activation and fusion with granules and lysosome ultimately leads to the destruction. And these are really clinically important enzymes. There are several diseases, and some of them are listed in your notes, that actually occur when we aren't able to make these. Particularly, there's a disease known as CGD, or chronic granulomatous disease. Um, patients with CGD are defective in NADPH oxidase. When you're defective in NADPH oxidase, you can't undergo respiratory burst or oxidative burst, or whatever you want to call it. If you can't undergo respiratory burst, you wind up with chronic bacterial infections as well as fungal infections. Chronic bacterial and fungal infections basically mean that you're at increased risk for significant bacterial infections, and those can be rather deadly. Um, and patients with CGD do often um, experience granulomas, and they're often fatal, and it's because they're unable to kill pathogens. Now, there is another disease that um, Dr. Zabo will talk more in depth with you about, and that's known as g 6 PD deficiency. These patients are deficient in glucose 6-phosphate dehydrogenase, which plays actually a role in the respiratory burst pathway. Once again, these patients are unable to kill pathogens as easily as patients who have this enzyme. However, while you're still likely to get chronic bacterial and fungal infections, the outcome of this one tends to be more one of anemia than it does to be death. Um, the infections are not as apparent as the anemia is. So that's kind of a differentiating factor between the two diseases.